As the Cloaca Maxima, a great canal, drained swamps around seven hills, small hamlets grew around a single forum. From this group of hamlets came Rome, the city that would rule Italy. Many Italian cities sat on hills by rivers, and Rome was no exception. Roman culture, however, made its citizens proud. They would keep revenging losses from others. After wars against its neighbors, Rome brought all Latin tribes under its sway and keep other Italian cities as military allies. Once Epirus and Carthage had fallen, Rome had an entire generation of veterans ready to conquer the Mediterranean. These conquests gave Rome much wealth. The Roman army had also given the lower classes a way for social mobility. They would be granted land, a salary, and all prestige that came from their service. Other than the enlisted's benefits, the Roman Republic and later empire as a whole gained much from expansion. The graph shows how much Rome benefited from expanding its army, whose conquests gave Rome so much coinage that it could afford not to tax its citizens anymore. The empire gave order and security to its subjects, a stark contrast to the chaos from the end of the Roman Republic. Roman culture became prestigious in conquered areas. Even with Romanization among elites, however, native languages and culture still flourished. Bilingualism and cultural syncretism ran rampant. Most importantly, local aristocrats and officials had enough freedom to work on their own without imperial interference. They represented the emperor in exchange for citizenship, lower taxes and tax allotments. Local aristocrats spent their own money mobilizing the local population, constructing productive industries and building public works, all in the Roman mold. Here was where Roman culture most expressed itself, architecture and industry. The local aristocrats and even the native population bought into the idea of empire wholesale, not least because interconnectedness and shared values brought them many benefits. However, as the need for public works decreased over time, local aristocrats directed their resources into building their own power bases. In Rome, chaos sprang as Commodus ruined the empire and the Severan dynasty debased coinage. The addition of cooling temperatures and an Ebola pandemic all led to the crisis of the 3rd century. The Gallic and Palmyrene empires showed what these local aristocrats could do with their power bases, create local Romes that could hold the empire at bay far away from the real Rome. After the crisis, the emperors Diocletian and Constantine brought reforms to the overstretched empire. Out of many laws and mandates passed, three broad ones stand out. Reforms in the Roman army, creation of the imperial bureaucracy, and increased centralization towards the person of the emperor. These three broad classes of reforms helped restore the empire in the 4th century. However, they also planted the seeds of the empire's own downfall in the 5th. In practice, they show the Roman Empire becoming more complex to fix structural faults that caused the crisis of the 3rd century, than the empire breaking under the weight of its own renewed complexity. Diocletian made the Roman army rely on imperial armories and blacksmiths, built more forts, and reorganized the provinces into a permanent war footing. The emperor also imposed conscription laws, forming the Limitani frontier armies. By AD 400, the late Roman army had around 350,000, 500,000 troops. This would be the army's high point in history. And I quote, the raw military power wielded by the 4th century Roman state was still extraordinary. Its scale of coordination was astonishing. The Roman army fielded half a million men, including 70,000 specialized troops, recruited and trained to ancient standards of discipline. The army was supplied and equipped by the most extensive logistical system the world had ever seen. The provision of weapons, armor, uniforms, animals and food depended on the imperial machine that Diocletian and Constantine had built. The Roman soldier carried arms manufactured in over three dozen specialized imperial factories spaced across three continents." End quote. From Kyle Harper's The Fate of Rome, 
Despite these reforms helping the empire survive the 4th ESD century, however, the late Roman army would face low recruitment later on. And I quote, the population grew, but the margins of abundance had been thinned. Even after the crisis had passed, the old, easy ways of military recruitment could not be resumed. The late antique state was heavy-handed. Diocletian and Constantine required the sons of soldiers and veterans to follow their fathers into the military life. Army service became virtually a heritable status. A combination of harsh violence and lucrative enticement was used to replenish the ranks. Standards were discreetly slackened. Five foot seven became the minimum height, in theory. The civil service was also an attractive and safe career. End quote. Roman social norms had changed to view military service as unmasculine and fit only for barbarians. Service in the bureaucracy became part of the Roman ideal of masculinity. The civilian administration thus expanded, going from a few hundred in the first century to over 35,000 after Diocletian's reforms. The imperial bureaucracy also became the favoured career for local aristocrats and elites instead of the military. While before the crisis, local aristocrats kept their native positions and ranks in exchange for loyalty to the empire, the new realities of universal citizenship and Diocletian's reforms saw them adapt into the new imperial system. While they still saw themselves as Romans, those who did join the army found more in common with the barbarians they were supposed to fight. Frontier soldiers often married barbarian women from the other side, Frontier settlers also traded with barbarians. Roman scouts would come into contact with them often enough, such that frontier Romans knew enough Germanic and Celtic, among other languages. Notoriously, the late Roman army adopted stereotypical barbarian customs and dress for cultural stereotypes made barbarians seem like the best fit for the army. And I quote, the army had created for itself a particularly barbarian identity but one which was a construct, owing much to classical ethnographic traditions. A parallel might be drawn from the types of gladiator used in classical circus games, which included the ethnic stereotypes Gauls, Thracians and Samnites. As a modern comparison, we might think of the Hollywood image of the Red Indian, a mythologized hodgepodge of authentic Native American elements and idealized and fictional components thrown together regardless of date or geographical origin, end quote, from Guy Halsall's Barbarian Migrations and the Roman West. While the late Roman army kept its ancient discipline, its prowess would erode over the 5th century. And I quote, an unbiased observer in the later 4th century would have noted the Roman army's numerical, tactical and logistical superiority on all fronts. But within the space of a few generations, the Roman imperial army in the West would cease to exist. The former territories of the West would be carved into successor kingdoms. The failure of empire was one of the greatest strategic implosions in history. As we have come to appreciate the reality of the empire's recovery in the 4th century, it has actually become harder to explain this failure. End quote from Kyle Harper. While the late Roman army still won most of its battles, it lost many men in a few key ones. These losses let barbarians settle in provinces that specialized in taxes and recruitment. The Roman army still performed well, but these losses meant that the empire needed resources and time to train more soldiers. Starting in the 420s, the foederati system was stepped up as a stopgap to allow for time and resources. Even then, barbarians never made up more than a third of the Roman army. The army's losses also meant that it could not protect citizens from bandits and rebellions. Imperial subjects found themselves more willing to serve the barbarian invaders for protection. Add how many soldiers already were used to them, and much incentive appears for these sections of the Roman citizenry to cast off the idea of empire in favor of local rulers. The people that once acclaimed the Roman emperors now acclaimed barbarian kings and commanders who took on Roman imperial signs and symbols for themselves. The bureaucracies increased standing over the army saw it have a greater role in the 4th century. 
For the lower classes, the bureaucracy meant a new way for social mobility. After getting enough education, any ordinary man could enter the civil service and work his way up the ranks. In fact, added to the ancient orders of equestrians and senators was a third noble order of the comitiva. These were once ordinary men who had worked their way up the civil service and now lived a good life as the emperor's companions. They helped rule the empire in his name. A complex system of bureaucratic ranks came with this order, with titles and honor conferred based on much criteria and qualifications. The local aristocracy, whose power helped cause the crisis of the third century, now lost its freedoms. Now that the empire no longer prioritized them, the local aristocrats had to reintegrate into the imperial system as high-ranking bureaucrats. Continuing the old patron-client system, aristocrats also brought their clients into the lower bureaucracy. While still reliant on old status and money, the aristocrats faced this new system where prestige leaned on civil service rank. In general, the 4th century saw more importance and resources levied onto the frontiers. Cities like Milan and Trier served as imperial capitals, frontier garrisons became important parts of imperial defense, and local aristocrats garnered more power through the imperial bureaucracy. In fact, the early 5th century's chaos gave the local aristocracy more incentive to focus on their locales over the larger empire. As the imperial army could no longer protect them, the Roman Empire as an idea. All its signs and symbols lost all meaning to local aristocrats. The settling of Foederati in key provinces also gave bureaucrats in general a way to work for these new rulers instead of the larger empire. The barbarians gave them what Rome could not, the imperial system in miniature. As part of Diocletian's reforms, the Roman emperor did away with his republican title of princeps and gave himself that of dominus. Roman citizens now had to submit to the emperor's person. Imperial pomp and ritual cloaked him in mystique, and citizens had to bow to the floor three times in the Persian way when meeting him. In practice, the empire centralized further around the emperor's will. The bureaucracy and the army served as extensions of his will, a far cry from the aristocracy representing his person in exchange for privileges, or the army relying on private contributions and markets for success. As part of these centralizing efforts, taxation grew. Farmers could not leave their lands. Boys followed their father's footsteps in work, among other changes. This new time was that of problem-solving emperors. The empire's health leaned on the emperor's ability to solve problems. This rebound from the crisis may have been when the empire was at its high point, a new Pax Romana built on this more centralized and more complex empire. However, this new centralization meant that the quality of emperors affected the empire more. Mismanagement of the Gothic migrations under Valens caused the emperor's death and larger effects on the Roman army. Further succession of bad and weak emperors meant that Rome could not fix problems afflicting the army and bureaucracy, if they could even be fixed. And I quote, A clear sign of the personalization of late Roman politics is the prominence of murders in the 5th century. These were the ministerial crises of the day. The overthrow and beheading of Stilicho, 408, was still garbed in official niceties but accompanied by the extra-legal massacre of his satellites. The generals Boniface and Aetius fought it out man-to-man -man for supremacy in the Western Empire, with the latter prevailing over his rival and gaining a wife when Boniface died of his wounds, 432. Aetius, at the height of his power, was slain in the palace, a locale beyond investigation, 454. His death was avenged by the killing of the Emperor Valentinian III, 455. A rival of the strongman Rissima, Marcellinus, was assassinated in Sicily, 468, in connection with a failed war that in the east sealed the fate of Aspar, the long-lived strongman of Constantinople, 471. To avoid bloodshed, the dethroned usurper Basiliscus and his family were thrown in a pit and left to the mercy of nature, 476. Theodoric the Ostrogoth personally killed two rivals, Resitach, 
son of Theodoric Strabo, 484, and Odoacer, 493. The usurper Vitalian was a thorn in the side of the Emperor Anastasius. Honoured at the accession of Justin Brump, he soon met his death in the palace, 520. These events and others like them were not unprecedented in Roman history, but were overshadowed then by decorous institutions. Their persistence in the political life of late antiquity underscores the importance of individuals and alliances among them. End quote. From Walter Goffert's Barbarian Tides. The late antique Roman machine needed many cogs to keep working. These cogs were supposed to be fail-safes against the crisis of the third century's causes. These worked for the next century or so, when Rome reached its peak in all of history. Yet the following century brought new problems which relied more and more on these cogs working as they should have. Once the seams fell, the empire went with them. As the empire failed its citizens, so did its citizens seek new power structures for stability. The invading barbarians who increasingly adopted Roman dress, culture, language and institutions became this local alternative. Rome's decline came from being pulled at the seams under multiple problems. The Western Roman Empire then did not die a natural death, nor was it murdered or militarily defeated. It accidentally committed suicide. We can easily see Joseph Tainter's words play out. Aristocrats and citizens clung to local Romes, ran by the barbarians rather than the fading idea of empire. The fall of Rome was less a series of defeats and political altercations and more the replacement of a complex empire by local regimes. Vieta in Terror brings the latest scholarship in medieval times to a general audience. Popular consciousness is rife with misconceptions and myths about medieval times owing to inertia in the school system, peer education or just plain laziness. However, our mission needs time and effort to bring about. We have great passion towards this interesting and often misunderstood time period. Please see the description below for ways where you can give even the smallest support.